The Apostle John walked closely with Jesus during all of his earthly ministry. He was used of God to give us a remarkable, intimate, powerful account of the ministry of Jesus. The Gospel of John was written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John composed his Gospel to provide reasons of saving faith proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and offers the gift of salvation. He declares that these things are written so that you may believe. Let's turn in our Bibles together to John chapter 12 this morning as we resume our study in the book of John and pick up where we left off two Sundays ago with Brother Vody. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but a little over a month ago, on December 10th, the evening of December 10th, 2021, there were a bunch of tornadoes that hit the central and southern regions of the United States. National Weather Service confirms that there were 61 different tornadoes in that storm system that night, affecting eight different states. And over 80 people died. One particular tornado was on the ground for 230 miles. That's like from here to almost Jacksonville. Quite a storm. And as is often the case when a powerful news story like that happens, we see both the good and the bad in the aftermath of the storm. We see the worst of people, and we see the best of people as well. In Arkansas, that night, there was a story of a nursing home assistant who, just in the nick of time, wheeled one of her residents into his bathroom and covered him with her body, shielding him from the debris as the tornado hit the building. But on the other side of that coin, in Kentucky, there were six people from out of state that were arrested a week after the storm because they possessed items that they had stolen from homes and cars in the devastated areas. Good and bad responses in the aftermath of a powerful event. So as we pick up where we left off two Sundays ago, we're also gonna see today both good and bad responses in the aftermath of a powerful event, but that powerful event was the resurrection of Lazarus by Jesus. So let's see what God's word has to say about this. And let's stand together and honor the reading of his word. As we look at John 12, at what I've entitled Responses in the Aftermath. John 12, beginning in verse one, the word of God says this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance from the scripture, from the perfume. But as Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away believing in Jesus. You may be seated, and may God bless the reading of his word. So what we have here are responses in the aftermath. And the very first response that we see is from the sisters. Number one on your outline would be from the sisters. Now the setting of this passage is an interesting one. These three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, comprise a family that Jesus loves and he spends a lot of time with during his earthly ministry. And in this moment, 
we get a glimpse here that things are kind of back to normal for this family. I mean, think about how many times you've wanted that in the past two years. You've said to yourself, wow, I can't wait until things get back to normal. Well, it, same is true for here. For just a, a day or so, things are sort of back to normal for this family. Lazarus is alive again, and Jesus is now back hanging out with his family that he loves. But they're not in their own home like we have seen before. See, this event that we just read is also accounted for in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. And I've put those two parallel passages on your outline this morning because from those two passages, we find out that this dinner to honor Jesus is in the home of Simon, the former leper whom Jesus had healed of his leprosy. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are not in their own home, but it's evident that they feel at home in Simon's house, specifically because of what Martha is doing. And that's the very first response that we see. Look at verse two. Look at what it says. So they gave for him a dinner there. Martha served. The first response that we see, letter A on your outline, is healthy service. The response of healthy service. <laughs> you know, if you know your Bible well, you may remember that there's already been a moment in Martha's life where Martha got frustrated with Jesus. You ever been frustrated serving Jesus? Of course you have. You're a sinner. <laughs> and you serve with other sinners. We get frustrated. Martha's account there is, is it actually in Luke 10, and that's where we see her getting irritated with her sister Mary, who's just kind of sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus teach, while Martha is trying to get ready for company. Now, I hope you know what company is. In Texas, we spell it K-U-M-P-N-E-E, -E, company. Company is them folks that are coming over. That's who company is. And Martha's trying to get ready for company, but Mary won't help her. So she's frustrated with Mary. But she's also frustrated with Jesus because Jesus won't tell Mary to help her get ready for company. Now let's be clear. In Luke 10, Martha's service was not where she fell short. Serving Jesus is a good thing, but you and I are so depraved that we can taint good things even with our own sinfulness. And Jesus ended up rebuking Martha in Luke 10 because she prioritized her service to Jesus over her fellowship with Jesus. Luke 10 puts it this way, beginning in verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So again, Martha's service to Jesus is not the issue. But her being anxious and troubled, that's the issue. And that comes about from her having the wrong priorities, which leads her into sin. And we know that because in Luke 10, she says two things to Jesus. One, she accuses him of not caring about her situation with the question, do you not care? But two, she tries to command Jesus when she says, tell her then to help me. Oh, you don't command Jesus, friends. You understand what's happened here in Luke 10 is that Martha has forgotten who her real master is. We can so do that today as well. As a follower of Jesus, Martha's not her own master. And if you're in Christ, neither are you, neither am I. Jesus is. Martha certainly wasn't her sister's Matthew master. Jesus was. But Jesus rebukes her because in forgetting who her master is, she got her priorities out of whack. Now, fast forward to this point that we're looking at in verse two of John 12. Let me ask you a question. What do you notice that is not present in this moment where Martha is serving? What's missing? Well, there's no rebuke by Jesus. <laughs> and there's no anxiety and frustration by Martha. 
She's doing the exact same thing. She's serving Jesus, but there's no rebuke from him and no sin on her part. Now, I want to make a disclaimer that making an argument from the silence of the scripture can be risky. So take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but I believe that Martha's service here with no revealed sin and no rebuke from Jesus might just be an indication that she now serves in a healthy way. She serves out of the overflow of the fellowship that she has with Jesus because honestly, that's the best way to serve him. I'll say it again, serving in Jesus, serving Jesus in ministry is a good thing, amen? It's what Christians do. So the growth that we might be seeing here in Martha can be a reminder to us that healthy service in the kingdom of God flows out of our fellowship with Christ. We don't have to serve the Lord, friends. We get to serve the Lord. And we get to serve him because of what he has accomplished in us, not because of what we are accomplishing for him in our ministry. Brothers and sisters, it is not our work that justifies us. It is the work that Jesus did on the cross that justifies us. And that sets us free to serve him out of the overflow of the fellowship that we have with him. As far back in the Bible as the book of Exodus, there's this connection between our deliverance by God and our service to God. God didn't deliver his people out of Egypt so that they could relax on the beach by the Mediterranean Sea. No, he delivered them from their bondage serving a cruel master so that they might be freed of that and instead experience the blessing of serving him. But that service came after he had delivered them. For Martha now, serving is not a, a frustrating obligation she has to do. It's a joy. It's an expression of joyful generosity, the kind that we talk about around here pretty often. It's a service that comes from a deep gratitude for the work that Jesus has done in her and her family. And regardless of where you serve Jesus, that's how we're to serve him. And that same gratitude shows up in the next response that takes place, and that's the response of Mary. And her response, let her be on your outline, is historic devotion. Mary has the response of historic devotion. Now, there's no argument for silence in this one. Because the text is so explicit in verse three. Look at it with me in your Bibles, verse three. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I just love that last statement in verse three about the, about the fragrance. Because it just reminds us that John is writing this as an eyewitness, or I guess better yet, a nose witness in this moment, because he was there. And if this moment kind of sounds familiar to you, there's a, there's a reason for that. See, Luke 7 records a moment where Jesus has been invited to the house of a Pharisee. And at that meal, a different woman with an immoral reputation comes into the room and she anoints Jesus' feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. And even though there's some similarities, Luke 7 is an entirely different moment than the one that we're looking at here in, verse, in, in John 12. The gospel accounts record two different anointings by Jesus by two completely different women. And what Mary does here in John 12 is an extravagant act of her gratitude to the Lord for him raising her brother from the dead. And what is it that she does for him? Well, look at the text. She humbly takes the place of a slave and anoints his feet with something evidently that has a ton of earthly value, but it doesn't matter to her because the gift that she gives pales in comparison to just being with Jesus. She's making a statement that Jesus' work in her life is invaluable. How about you? How about me? Do we believe that? Do we believe that the work of Jesus in our life is invaluable or is he just 
a nice addition to what we've already got going on. Maybe a more pointed question is, what are you and I not willing to give up in our life that would honor Jesus if we gave it up? See, friends, over and over again throughout the scripture, we see this principle of stewardship. That in this temporary life that we live here on this earth, God gives us stewardship over the stuff that we have, the relationships that we have, the the families that we've been given, the responsibilities and the gifts and the talents and the finances that we have. We're to be faithful stewards of all of those things because they are on loan to us from our master. So Mary tangibly expresses her love for Christ in a way that just shows that Jesus ranks high above even the most prized possession in her life. See, pure nard was a thick, fragrant ointment that came all the way from northern India. (laughs) Friends, northern India to Bethany is a little over 3,500 miles so if you, if you dump that ointment out all at one time, you're not going to be able to run down to the quickie mart to get some more. This is a rare and valuable gift, but it didn't matter because it was for Jesus. When's the last time you said that? Lord, I'll sacrifice this because it doesn't matter. It's for you, Jesus. In both of the parallel passages to John 12, Jesus states clearly that what Mary did here will not be forgotten in the future. Mark 14, 9 puts it this way. Jesus says, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. (laughs) Friends, this is historic devotion. In this unique promise that Jesus makes here about Mary's devotion, we see that the whole thing is pointing beyond the death of Jesus on the cross, beyond his burial, beyond the resurrection, to today, February 6, 2022, in our gathering as the gospel is being preached. This promise of Jesus is coming true in our midst right now. It's phenomenal. So the responses of these two sisters are service and devotion, but they are quite different than the response of the false disciple. It's number two on your outline, from the false disciple. Because what we see beginning in verses four and five are the first words of Judas Iscariot found anywhere in the scriptures. It's right here. And it's important to know what the scripture says about Judas, and we don't have to go far to see that. Back in John 6, we were looking at that a few months ago. Jesus was explaining to his disciples how salvation works, that salvation is initiated by God, not us. It's sustained by God, not us. And it's completed by God, not us. (laughs) And Jesus says in John 6, beginning verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to the Father unless it is, can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Friends, that last part in John 6 is about Judas. And in other places in the book of John, Jesus labels Judas as a devil and the son of destruction. And the other gospel accounts create this composite of Judas as a man who is motivated by money, under satanic influence, and one who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And yet, for three years... Judas plays along as one of the 12. He sits under the teaching of Jesus. He participates in the ministry of Jesus. But the scriptures make it clear that Judas was an unbeliever. Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way. He says, Judas is the greatest example of missed opportunity in history. And he's right. 
And in the final analysis of all things, Judas was an unbeliever because the Father did not grant that Judas come to Jesus. By the way, that's true of every person who dies outside of Christ. Friends, Jesus warns us about false conversion. He does so in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 where there will be on judgment day people that will call Jesus Lord and he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. And then there's Mark 4, where Jesus' main point in the parable of the four soils is to make the distinction between true conversion and false conversion. And if you've never given false conversion much thought, I want to recommend a book to you by Ray Comfort. I put it at the bottom of your outline. It's called Hell's Best Kept Secret. It's a good read. My friends, Judas was never a true disciple to begin with. And that just speaks to the sovereignty of God over all things, including the salvation of sinners. He was a false disciple, and he proves it here in his question of spiteful opposition. Letter A on your outline, Judas' first response is spiteful opposition. Look at verse 5 in the text in John 12. Because Judas asks a question. Look at the question. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, 300 denarii was a full year's salary for a worker, which again just speaks to the extravagance of Mary's gratitude to Jesus. But what's important not to miss here is that Judas was not just opposing Mary, but he was also opposing Jesus. He was opposing Mary for wasting the expensive perfume on Jesus, who Judas didn't think was worth it. But he's also opposing Jesus for accepting Mary's gift. It's spiteful opposition to both of them, but of course the more profane opposition is to Jesus. Because what Judas is doing here is he's calling into question the judgment of the Lord himself. Friends, don't ever forget that the fundamental reason that a person is lost and does not believe in Jesus is because they love their sin. And that's exactly how it was for you and I before we came to faith in Christ. Love of sin always springs from a pride that I know better than God does. Go all the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And you'll see that Adam and Eve were given one command, one command to obey, that's it. And yet they transgressed that command because they thought they knew better than God does. This is where Judas was in his spiteful opposition. But then we find out there's a second response from Judas, and that is selfish protests. Letter B on your outline would be selfish protests. Verse six, look at it with me in your copy of the word. Verse six. John is writing here. John says he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Remember, Judas was the treasurer among the 12. So he was the one that managed the fund of money that people gave to support the work of Jesus and the disciples. And in verse six here, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, makes this clarifying comment 50 years after this moment because now he clearly knows that Jesus had a habit of helping himself to the money bag. But John didn't know it at the time. Hindsight can be a really good teacher, can it? So it's clear that Judas' protest here is for his own personal benefit. Again, think about why Judas is lost. He loves his sin, he didn't care about the poor. He loved money. And that's a whole year of salary. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money to Judas, and we know that because he's going to settle for a third of that amount when he betrays Jesus and turns him over to the temple guard. One of the reasons that John is sharing the details of this protest in the way that he's writing it here is really to set up a contrast between Judas and Mary. You may have already noticed that. 
You know, throughout this study, we've seen moments that highlight the difference between true belief in Jesus and unbelief. And this dinner party is no different. Mary is truly a follower of Christ, and that's made clear by her unembarrassed devotion to the Lord. Yet in that same moment, Judas is opposed to Christ because, well, it's just another day of him living for himself. And friends, that's all it takes to be opposed to Christ, just another day of you living for yourself. Nobody's neutral about Jesus. Nobody. He himself said in Luke eleven twenty three, whoever is not with me is against me. And there is a clear contrast here. As Mary sees Jesus having invaluable worth, while Judas just sees Jesus as a means to his own ends. Author and pastor Scotty Smith says this, one is a worshiper, and one is a thief. One gives sacrificial honor, the other seeks personal gain. One demonstrates the way of grace, and the other, the way of sin. Good question for each of us to ask ourselves is who do we identify more with, Judas or Mary? The responses here from the false disciple are very different than the responses from the sisters. But now what we see in the text is the response from the Savior. Number three on your outline. From the Savior. Jesus' response to the protest of Judas is in verse seven. And, and he says what? Look at it with me. Leave her alone. I love that. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Jesus' response here is sacrificial defense sacrificial defense. There's a protective tone to this when Jesus defends Mary. And, and he's applauding her act of gratitude. And in doing so, he affirms that Mary understands why he has come. See, she gets it. She's already heard Jesus say that he has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mary paid attention to the times that Jesus spoke of his impending death. And now she has anointed his entire body, similar to what you would do in that culture after someone has died. Now, I realize that, only, that John only mentions Jesus' feet being anointed, but again, in one of the parallel passages in Mark 14, Jesus says this, she has done a beautiful thing to me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. See the contrast between Mary and Judas? Mary is honoring the death of Jesus while Judas will end up facilitating the death of Jesus. So in his response to this, Jesus points to his own death. And he makes that clear when he says in verse eight, for the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Now, to be clear here, Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to give to the poor. The Bible affirms that in a lot of other places. It is right to do that. But Jesus' point to Judas and the other disciples here is that they have, will have plenty of time to minister to the poor, but they have very little time to be with him. And that's not an arrogant statement when it's being made by the Son of God. So, we have the responses from the sisters, the responses from the false disciple, the response from the Savior, and number four, we have the response from the crowd. Number four would be the crowd. The crowd on this day is interested in seeing someone, right? They're interested in seeing Jesus, but they're also interested in seeing someone else. Look at verse nine in your Bibles. The large crowd came, not only on account of him, but also to see who? Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. The response of the crowd here is one of temporary interest. The crowd has a response of temporary interest. This is just another example of what we've already seen several times in our study of John, where, where people affirm this, this worldly mindset that seeing is believing. They wanted to see proof 
of a living, breathing Lazarus <laughs> because they'd heard that Jesus had raised him from the dead. So for them, seeing is believing. But friends, the Christian life, that's not the case. Seeing is not believing. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. As believers in Christ, our faith does not require visual proof. But here in John 12, the crowd's not going to believe unless they see Lazarus themselves. And once they did, I'm sure they were impressed, but they didn't stick around very long. And you know, that's kind of the nature of a crowd. Crowds usually come together because of a temporary interest. You think about a football game or a concert or a political rally. It's a temporary interest. They don't stick around long. And ultimately, they're not a cohesive group. See, this same crowd that's interested in Jesus and Lazarus on this day, they're going to be screaming at the top of their lungs in just a few days for Jesus to be crucified. Brothers and sisters, let's don't ever be impressed by large crowds. Jesus wasn't, and you and I shouldn't be either. And let's don't ever think of our church as a crowd because it's not. It's a family. Amen. It's a body of interconnected, interdependent brothers and sisters. It's the body of Christ. Finally, we come to the last response in the aftermath of Lazarus' resurrection. And that is number five on your outline from the leaders, the response from the leaders. Now, I will say that this large crowd is instructive for us because it shows that the religious leaders were losing popularity. As we might say today, their poll numbers are underwater. The chief priests were the highest level of Hebrew authority in Jerusalem. They were the ones that were in charge of temple worship in the city. So the people saw them as their representatives. And guess what? The representatives weren't doing what the people thought they should do, so the representatives were losing the support of the people. Hmm. My, my, how things haven't changed. But what the chief priests were doing was participating in something. They were participating in futile planning. Letter A and last on your outline is futile planning. Look at verse 10 in your Bibles. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. I want to first draw your attention to that little bitty phrase, as well. Because that means in addition to Jesus. They, they wanted to kill Lazarus just like they had already decided to kill Jesus. And we know that that plan was already in motion. But the new wrinkle in the plan now is to kill Lazarus. And that's important. Because if you get rid of him, you get rid of the proof that Jesus has power over death. I mean, come on, think about it. Down through the years in history, what's the main thing you want to do in a cover-up? Get rid of the evidence, right? Watergate, Russiagate, Irangate, Climategate, if you're a Patriots fan, Deflategate. The goal of a cover-up is to get rid of the evidence. And here, if the leaders get rid of Lazarus, they get rid of the evidence of Jesus' power over death. If they do that, and they're successful, they might just stop the problem described in verse 11 here. Because on account of him, meaning Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away believing in Jesus. Oh, no, 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 we can't have that. Now, we have no evidence that the chief priests were ever successful in getting rid of Lazarus, but their ultimate motive was to get rid of the influence of Jesus. And if you're a skeptic, you might say, well, they were successful on that, weren't they? I mean, they killed him on a cross. Oh, no, 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 just look around. Were they successful in getting rid of the influence of Jesus Christ? No, not a bit. And that's because God's sovereign redemptive plan of saving sinners will not be stopped. It was futile to try it then, just like it is now, because Jesus died on the cross by his own choosing. 
We've already studied John chapter 10, but in John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says of his life, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Oh, he died at the hand of sinful men. He died according to the will of the sovereign God of the universe, but he laid his life down for sinners like us. And you can believe that or not believe that. But I will warn you, the consequences of not believing that are eternally damning. There is a wide variety of responses in the aftermath of the resurrection of Lazarus, but they all fall into one of two buckets, belief or unbelief. The question is, where are you today?